I've got a question, a really important question I want to start out with this morning. And before you give kind of a knee-jerk reaction, I want you to really think about it. And here's the question. Do you really love Jesus? Whether your answer is yes or no, here's the second question. How do you know that? Well, if you said yes, you might say, well, I just, I just know that I know. I mean, uh, I'm not afraid to say that, at least in a gathering of believers. I wouldn't be afraid to say I love Jesus. And, you know, I do, uh, I do some things that I think God requires and that would please him. I volunteer in the children's ministry. I give faithfully some of my money to the Lord's work. I even try to love my enemies. Would not those be indicators that I truly Love Jesus. Well, they might be. But how about if we transition to a real-life kind of current illustration, one that would involve my professed love for my wife, Kelly. So let's say I come home this Wednesday. Guys, the clue phone's about to ring on the screen, so watch the screens. I come home this Wednesday, and it is Valentine's Day this Wednesday. So, okay, let's say I come home this Wednesday. I walk through the door with these, I give them to my wife, Kelly, and I say, Happy Valentine's Day. And she says to me, Wow, Rick, they're, they're beautiful. And assuming they're not left over from a funeral at church, <laughs> which I have done before, uh, <laughs> why did you go to such an expense for me? Okay, my reply is, well, it's Valentine's Day, you know, and, and um, it's my duty to come up with something that I think would, you'd be happy with, and I know some other guys do this kind of thing, so happy Valentine's Day. What do you think? Do you think that what she's holding at that moment in her hand is beautiful as they are, expensive as they are? Do you think she's thinking, he's just giving me a true indication of his deep, deep love for me? It's like the man who was finishing six weeks of marriage counseling. And after his wife had just expressed how, how wonderful it would be if occasionally he would just give her a kiss goodnight. That would mean a lot to her. The man ends the marriage counseling session by saying, Now, now counselor, are you saying I have to kiss my wife goodnight? What's the answer to that? What would you tell him? We'll come back to that. Measuring our love through just simple outward acts can be a pretty tricky business. And in this passage today, Jesus wants to communicate the need of our love for him to line up with our actions. In the passage you read this past week from John 14, 15 through 31, I want to talk to you about Two truths that are crystal clear here in this passage from these last words of Jesus to his disciples. Then I want to spend the rest of our time trying to very practically apply how these two important truths can and should affect our daily living as followers of Jesus. So here we go. I'll look on the back of your bulletin if you want to write these down. Here is the first truth, truth number one in this passage. Coming up on the screen, it says this. Let's say it together, would you? Obedience to Jesus' teachings is a true indicator of our love for him. We could go to many other passages that would back this up, but just in this passage alone, just in this one, look at what he says. Coming up on the screen, these verses, you can read them in your Bible, though. Look at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 21, whoever has my commandment and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, or the NIV, I like it even better, they will obey my teachings. In case you didn't get it, he gives you the opposite. He says, verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now, friends, we currently live in a culture when it, is now, it seems now acceptable to be able to say, uh, to be able to boldly say, I love Jesus 
while at the same time reconfiguring Jesus' commands to accommodate the ones you like. But Jesus clearly says here, he links our love for him to our obedience to his commands as he gave them, not as we reconstruct them. And if we do not keep our, those commands, it's proof, Jesus says, that there's something wrong in here. If someone told you they love their husband and wife, but then they told you they continually, almost every weekend, they pursue other partners on weekend flings, would you assume that they actually love their wife or husband? Probably not. Hopefully not. Why? Because their actions are speaking louder than their words. Jesus says here, what we say must line up with our actions. Now, as I've asked you to do throughout the series, I'd like you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes here at this moment as we walk through these last teachings of Jesus. Especially after Jesus says here to them, look, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Jesus made it clear. He's leaving them. Pastor Merrill went over that again last week. But he also gave them the assurance that someday they were going to be united with him. But between that someday, when they're going to be united, and as he leaves, he says the test of their love for him is going to be their obedience to him. Now, just think what's happened in the past few hours. All of them miserably failed his command. They all failed to his command to humble themselves and serve one another by washing each other's feet. They all failed that one. They've just heard, some of them just heard that one of them is going to totally betray Jesus. Peter's just been told that he's going to sometime in the near future deny Jesus. So I think if you're one of those disciples, if not all of them, maybe most of them were thinking, look, we're really having trouble obeying Jesus when he's physically with us. And now he says he's going to leave while telling us the measure of our love for him is going to be our obedience to his commands. It sounds like he is setting us up for failure. Well, it would be. If you stopped right there and did not announce a wonderful gift that was going to come to them in his absence. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But I don't want to leave truth number one without adding just a few additional thoughts here. When Jesus says we, our love for him would be evidenced by our obedience to his commands, I don't think he has just one specific command in mind here. Now, he's just given some commands that they, about loving one another, serving one another. I'm sure he has those in mind. But I don't think he has just one or two in mind here. Jesus is describing here a life of obedience to the whole teaching of the scriptures. That's why I like some of your translations say, whoever obeys my teachings... And I bring this up because, again, it's become more and more acceptable for people to embrace some of Jesus' teachings while ignoring others. To focus on the thing they like, ignore the things they find unappealing. It's become more and more common for people to say, one of Jesus' greatest commands is that we love one another. It's all about love. And I do love this person. They just happen not to be the one I'm married to. And I do love this person who just happens to be the same sex as me. So now heterosexual sin and homosexual sin can be embraced by professed followers of Jesus because of an appeal to following one of Jesus' commands, the specific one, that we love one another. And the obvious problem with this logic, I hope it's obvious, it's becoming less obvious, is that it completely and conveniently ignores Jesus' other teachings. Like this one, just as an example, Matthew 19, coming up at the screen. What's Jesus say here in another passage? He says this. He answered them when they asked about divorce and remarriage. He said, have you not read that he, God, who created them from the beginning, made them male and female. And he said, therefore, a man, I should insert here, a biologically born man, shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, a biologically born female, and the two shall become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. 
in this teaching of Jesus, it's very clear that he says we're not free. Even under the guise of love, we're not free to take our one flesh union and unite with someone who's not in the covenant of marriage with us, nor are we free to unite with someone who's uh, of a different sex. So we can't leave one of Jesus' teachings for another. Uh, Commentator Matt Carter says this way, we're not at liberty to say, look, I love Jesus. See how I obey him. And then point to the commands easiest for us to obey and that we agree with while ignoring, ignoring the challenging and difficult ones, the ones we don't like or don't agree with. Now, obeying Jesus' commands isn't always easy. He never said it would be. And what is this series entitled? What's the title of the series? Anybody? What's the title of the series? I'm giving you a big clue. <laughs> well, okay, I put it up there. Didn't anybody miss it? Follow me. And now look down, if you got your Bible, but look down at verse 30 and 31 how Jesus ends this teaching. Satan has no claim on me, Jesus says, but I do, this is Jesus, as the Father commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Jesus not only says obedience and love for the Father go hand in hand, but he says, I'm going to demonstrate it. The world knew Jesus loved the Father because he obeyed the Father's commands even and especially the difficult ones, right? Wouldn't you say going to the cross, being beaten, shamed, humiliated would be difficult? But Jesus says, I'm going to obey my Father's commands so that the world will see I love him and they'll get the connection between love and obedience and the commands. So Jesus again says, follow me. I'll lead. So truth number one clearly communicates, Jesus clearly communicates to his disciples. Obedience to Jesus' teachings is a true indicator of our love for him. So a good question here would just stop and ask, would say, what would your current state of obedience indicate about your love for Jesus? What would your current state of obedience indicate about your love for Jesus? Now the disciples, again, upon hearing this about their Obedience being indicated their love. And some of us even this morning about hearing this, they might, you might think, hey, this is a setup for failure here. I know I cannot keep <laughs> Jesus' commands. I know I need a lot of help. Well, that's true. I got great news for you. Great news for the disciples back then. Great news for us right now. Look, hey, by the way, Jesus knew they couldn't keep his commands. He lived with them for three years. It was very obvious. He knows you and I can't keep his commands. He's known us before we were born. So look at what Jesus says in the very next sentence, right after he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, you'll obey what I've commanded. This is one of the greatest verses of assurance in the Bible. It's coming up, verse 16. Let's all read it together. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Truth number two, if you're feeling out your outline, would be this. We cannot obey and grow in our love for Jesus without help. We cannot. Jesus says, I'm leaving. Uh, you need help. And the Father who loves to give good gifts to those who ask and those who acknowledge they need help, the Father is going to send permanent help in the form of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now, the following three chapters, John 15 through 17, as we go through them, Jesus is going to have a lot more to say about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to try to cover all that today, but for today, just from this first introduction or announcement of the coming of the Holy Spirit, let's just note a few things here. Okay, number one would be this. The Holy Spirit is given as a gift. Verse 16, he says, he will give you another helper. It's not something we earn. It's a gift we receive. We receive it upon our repentance and belief coming to Christ when we are born again. This is what uh, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We were all baptized one by one spirit into one body. Paul says in Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So conversely, if you belong to Christ, you have the spirit of Christ. You were baptized into one body through the spirit. Second thing to note is this. The Holy Spirit is a person. 
Pastor Steve referred to this. Notice the pronouns throughout these verses, right? He, him. The Holy Spirit is not some ghost. If you, I, know, I know the King James has the Holy Ghost, and when I was a kid, that scared me, man. Holy Ghost. You know, I was watching Casper at that time, so I was scared, okay? But he's not some kind of impersonal force that floats around. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. That'd be a long topic. I'm just going to state it and move on. Number three. Notice the terms used to describe the Holy Spirit. He's clearly identified, if you look down to verse 26, as the Holy Spirit. But the actual Greek word that is used uh, by Jesus in verse 16 is this Greek word, parakletos. Uh, parakletos, which is an uh, English word, would be paraclete. Okay, that's not a word we use every day. And when translators try to translate that one word, there is no one word that kind of adequately fulfills it all. Part of that's because the Holy Spirit is so wonderful and has so many uh, roles. So that's why, no matter what translation you got this morning, you might have the word advocate. The King James uses the word comforter. The NIV uses the word counselor. Uh, The ESV, which we're using this morning, has the word helper. The term paraclete literally means to come alongside someone as to offer help. That's where they get the term helper. I like the term helper. That's why I've used the ESV this morning because it reminds me that I can never love Jesus like I want to and like I should. I can never obey Jesus like I want to and that I know I should without some supernatural help. So we humble ourselves. We daily cry out for the helper. We need help. I vividly remember my first year sitting down with three high school students. This probably would have been, I think it was fall of 1983. Sitting down with three high school students from this church. They all go to different public high schools. They all want to grow in their faith in Jesus. So I'm sitting, and I had this curriculum from Campus Crusade at the time, but it was for high school students. Sitting down, open the book, I'm around. I got Mike, Tom, and Mark. I can see him like it was yesterday. And here's, the, here's one of the first sentences in the book to, to really encourage these guys who are trying to live out their faith in public high school. The Christian life is not only hard, it is impossible. How's that for some words of assurance for you guys this morning? Just, uh, hey, go go at it. Have a great time. Well, as we read through, what was the author trying to communicate? He wanted to communicate right from the beginning that without the help of the Holy Spirit to help us grow into Christ's likeness, all your human effort will mean nothing. All of us needed to hear that 40-some years ago. The last thing, note here about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember this, the disciples' hearts are troubled. They're troubled. Jesus is leaving. Now he says, by our obedience, we're going to know if we love him, and we can't even love him when he's around. So Jesus here just pours on the assurance. He says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, verse 18. I'm going to ask the Father. He's going to send another helper. That word another is a loss in the Greek. It doesn't mean another of a different kind. It means another of the same kind. Wrap your head around that. Then he says, this helper is going to be with them forever. Now, why would that be so important for them? Well, if you know under the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit didn't dwell in anybody. But Jesus said, now he's going to come in you, within you. The Holy Spirit came upon people in the Old Testament for certain points of their life for certain tasks that God had. But you know what? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could be taken away from you. Do you remember what it said about Saul after his sin? What? The Spirit departed from Saul. Why is David crying out in Psalm 51 after his sin with Bathsheba? And take not your Holy Spirit from me. You know why? Because under the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, God could take it away. But listen to the insurance here when he says, he's coming forever. It's going to be in you forever. And what must have seemed to them, the Holy Spirit was coming. This is the most wild thing. Last thing I'll say here is the Holy Spirit, he's coming to make a dwelling place within them for the Father and the Son. Just a little tidbit here. Check this out. Go back to Pastor Mel uh, last week. The Greek word used in verse 2 when, when Jesus is describing this dwelling place that Jesus is preparing for his disciples. It's a Greek word, mone. That's the Greek word. 
It's the same Greek word used in verse 23, if you go down there, where Jesus says, hey, if you you love me, obey me, we, that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we're going to come and make our home, same word, dwelling place, mune, in you. So Jesus goes to the Father in order to prepare a dwelling place for these disciples. But between now and then, before they get to this dwelling place, what is Jesus saying here? He's saying until that day, the Holy Spirit's coming from the Father to prepare a dwelling place for the Father and Son in their hearts. Again, try to wrap your mind around that. So truth number one says obedience to Jesus' teachings is a true indicator of our love for him. Truth number two reminds us that we cannot obey and grow in our love for Jesus without help. The help of the helper, the Holy Spirit. Now I want to spend the remaining time with answering this question. And there's many answers to this, but how does the Holy Spirit help us then? Specifically, how does the Holy Spirit help us to obey Jesus' teachings? If obedience to Jesus' teaching is a true indicator of our love for him, and we're given the Holy Spirit to help us obey, in practical terms, what are some of the ways the helper actually empowers us, believers like you and me, to keep Jesus' commands? There are many, but here's just three I want you to think about. Number one is this, the Holy Spirit reveals truth to us. If you notice in verse 17, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. Jesus will later say, and we'll get to this in a couple weeks in chapter 16, that the Holy Spirit will guide followers of Jesus into all truth. Before we come to Christ, according to Jesus, earlier in John, no one comes unless they're drawn to him. The way he draws people is through the Holy Spirit who reveals truth to their hearts. What truth does he have to reveal? Primarily, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. But upon coming to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit continues. He's not done revealing truth. He continues to reveal God's truth. And he does that primarily through God's Word. Primarily. As we read it, as we said, it's called the sword of the Spirit by the Apostle Paul. As we read it, the Holy Spirit illuminates God's Word to our hearts so that we can understand what pleases God, what doesn't please God, so we can understand what is true, what is not true. Later in John 17, Jesus prays for his disciples with these words. John 17, coming up uh, up on the screen here. Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Jesus prays for his disciples. God, use use the truth of your word. Illuminate through the work of your Holy Spirit to help these disciples grow in Christ-like character. So here's how it works. Jesus says, your obedience to my teachings will be a true indicator of your love for me. But in order to be obedient, we need to be reminded of what his teachings are the place we find the teaching is in his word, and as we discipline ourselves to read it and study it, the Holy Spirit will do the work of opening up our hearts and our minds to understand it and to teach us what the truth is, what things please Jesus, what things do not please Jesus. So we got a hunger for this book and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate it as we read it. Look, if a stranger walked up on the street today as you went home and said, hey, if over the next week you do some things for me that would demonstrate that you love me, I'll give you $50,000. What would you be asking next? Hey, why don't you tell me things that you really like and love? I want to do them for you. Jesus tells his followers, read this. It will show you what I love. It will show you what's true. Read it, study it, and the spirit of truth will come alongside and he'll reveal to you what pleases me and he will help you obey. Second way the Holy Spirit empowers us to obey is through supernatural empowerment. I don't like to double up on words here, so maybe I want to say this. Uh, He strengthens us towards obedience. The Holy Spirit strengthens us to enable us to obey. Remember the definition of paraclete is someone who what? Comes alongside to help. 
In Paul's heartfelt prayer for the Ephesians, in Ephesians 3.16, here's what Paul prays. I pray that God will grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. You know, living the Christian life is a, is a supernatural experience. Everything about the Christian life, matter of fact, quite a few things, can't be just simply explained on a natural level. And so what I'm trying to say here in this point is that no matter how long, how long you walk with Christ, how much of the Bible you think you know, how much we think we love Jesus and want to obey them, there are times when the best thing we can do is simply fall on our knees before God and cry out, Holy Spirit, strengthen me. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need your strength and your power. I know what I should do. Even what I want to do. I know I need to forgive that person. I know I need to go and ask forgiveness. I know I need to say no to this craving that's currently come upon my flesh. I know I need to speak truth to that person. But I am in desperate need right now of your help and your power. So please... Please, I beg you, come alongside of me and strengthen me to do what I cannot at this moment do. God's honored when we get to that point, okay? He's trying to get us to that point, pray multiple times through the day to find out you can't do it. He strengthens us, empowers us. The third and last way the Holy Spirit empowers us to obey is through conviction. So listen to what Jesus says down in verse 26. If you got your Bible still there. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. We're going to see again in a few weeks here in John 16, Jesus is going to say that one of the roles or functions of the Holy Spirit is that he will convict the world concerning sin. In the life of a believer, since the Holy Spirit is working in us to conform us to the likeness of Christ, he will convict us of sin. And one of the primary ways he does that is through the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance the teachings of Jesus and the Word of God. Now, how does this practically work? Well, you may be out there this week tempted to make, purchase, make another purchase of something you absolutely do not need. And the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance that story in Luke 12. The rich young fool who kept building bigger barns to store all the stuff he didn't need. Or Jesus' teaching of laying up treasure in heaven. You may be tempted to retaliate against someone this week, against an enemy this week, but then the Holy Spirit is going to bring to your remembrance the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. You might be tempted to allow fear and anxiety to overtake you because of some trying circumstances that have come upon you in recent days, but then the Holy Spirit convicts you by reminding you of the words of Jesus. Why are you so afraid? Why do you have such little faith? Do not be anxious. The Father knows what you need. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit has more opportunity to do that if we're reading God's Word. But this is how the Holy Spirit often works. Sends convictions when we're tempted. He reminds us of the truth to give us the opportunity to turn from that temptation and to find our true satisfaction in Christ and not in the thing we're being tempted to do. We obey these promptings from the Holy Spirit because we know they come from a God who loves us. And we want to show our love for him in return by our obedience to his commands. This won't always be easy. And sometimes our love for God may not be the primary motivating factor behind our obedience. Sometimes our obedient actions precede our feelings of love for the Savior. But in the course of our determined Spirit-empowered obedience. The feelings we desire also come. We obey not because we have to, but because we want to. 
So which is it? This is what I thought about this. Do, do we pray for a deeper love of Jesus? And out of that, obedience will naturally flow? Or do we obey, whether we feel like it or not? And out of that spirit-empowered obedience, love will eventually grow. Well, the answer to that is yes. Both. And the answer to that husband is yes. Do you remember that husband from way the beginning with the counselor? The answer is yes. You should kiss your wife goodnight. Whether you feel like it or not. Because it communicates love to her. And because you made a vow to God to love her as Christ loved the church. Do it out of duty if you must. We pray that one day you will do it out of love. Likewise, my friends, at times our obedience to Jesus will, will sometimes be done out of a sense of duty and only done with the help of the Holy Spirit's enabling power. In such times, what should we do? We should continue to plead with God daily that the Holy Spirit will so pour out the love of Christ into our hearts that we will obey not because we have to, but because we want to. This is the life that the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, this is a life that the Holy Spirit wants to cultivate in each and every heart here this morning. Hearts that obey, not because they have to, but hearts that are so overcome and in awe of the love of Jesus for them that they actually they want to obey. Would you pray with me? As we pray in closing, I've got two specific words for two different groups. So if one of these fits, apply it. Jesus has said, our obedience is a true test of our love for Jesus. So my first question to some group is this. Has the Holy Spirit been convicting you of some disobedience? But instead of listening to his voice, you've turned a deaf ear rather than repenting. Perhaps you're even trying to cover up your disobedience by giving Jesus some obligatory obedience in some other areas of your life. Trying to convince yourself and others that you really do love Jesus, giving the roses as a cover-up for a heart that's hardened, that's not being obedient. Would you right now, right now, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and confess and turn from whatever that sin is. If he's spoken to you about it, confess it right now. Turn from it. If you need to get help for it, say, God, whatever it takes, I'm going to turn. I know this has been disobedient. I'm trying to cover it up in other ways. But you know about it. second group I'd like to speak a word to is those in this category who have been striving to obey Jesus and his commands, but it, it's been a very difficult season, and you might feel like you are an orphan at this point this morning. You might feel like, I'm, I feel abandoned by God. Look at twice in this passage, and if you read it again, you'll see it. Jesus says this twice in this passage, he who does, he who loves me will be loved by the Father. Those who obey my teaching, my Father will love him. So if you've been striving to walk in obedience, but you honestly are saying this morning, where's God? Why, why, why doesn't he respond to my obedience, honor my obedience? Would you let the Holy Spirit speak those words of assurance to your heart right now this morning that you are not abandoned? The Father deeply loves you. He loves you. So persevere. Receive his love this morning. Be assured of it. 
Receive his peace, the peace that only he can give through his Holy Spirit. And receive these words that he spoke in this passage as well this morning. Receive them for yourself. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Receive them from the Father who loves you this morning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. The Father loves you. He sees your obedience. Would you stand together? We'll pray. Closing. <clears throat> Father, we thank you this morning for all these words of assurance, especially for the assurance that you would send a helper. Because, God, we know that even in our best days, when we truly want to obey your commands, when we want to show our love for you, God, we fail. But we thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper, to strengthen us, to obey, to convict us when we get off track, to remind us of the truth, of the things that do please you. Help us to walk by your spirit this week as your word tells us to. To be digging in your word so that we hear the voice of your spirit. To take time to be quiet before you that we might hear the voice of your spirit. Thank you, Lord. We go forward in that confidence knowing that we are loved deeply more than we can imagine. Help us to show our love for you this week, Lord, through our desire to obey you and please you. Thank you for pouring out your love to us. Thank you for se uh, setting the example of obedience and following your Father's commands. Thank you. Praise you. We ask this all in the name of Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. And all of God's people said, Amen. <laughs>